Hi Raj, thank you for joining us to talk about ESG and partnerships. You've had quite a deep and varied involvement with ESG. Could you tell us more about your experience? Sure, um, I started as a regulator in, in environment and um, started working for BHP and Rio Tinto after that in the first 10 years of my career. Uh, I did quite a lot of consulting afterwards, especially when sustainability was becoming a, a bigger thing in the corporate world. So this was back in the, in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and then I joined Origin Energy as their head of sustainability for close to a decade, uh, where I was looking after sustainability and ESG issues around the time where uh, investor interest in ESG was starting to ramp up quite rapidly. Um, now I work as a non-executive director and an auditor on ESG issues. You wrote a textbook recently, Leaving Tomorrow. Was that about ESG and partnership? Yeah, so following a passion of mine, I guess, um, I'd noticed in the corporate world that there was a, a need for, for leaders to adopt a more holistic view of how they um, ran an organisation. So uh, this book was uh, aimed at um, postgraduate students, MBA students, future leaders of tomorrow, really uh, encouraging them to adopt a broader ESG uh, involved way of, of running major corporations. Mm. And we see a lot in business media these days, a lot about ESG. So globally and in Australia, what do you think has been driving that? I uh, look at, you know, ESG, um, it's, it's, a, it's a term that's been coined quite recently. And, and before that, um, the term sustainability and responsible, uh, responsible businesses was probably more used. So about two decades ago, the investment community started talking about principles of responsible investment, PRIs. And, and this was really to, to uh, invest more heavily in, in companies that had a broader view of societal good and were therefore intrinsically more sustainable. You know, they'd have more license to operate or they'd have fewer shutdowns, fewer uh, environmental disasters and, and, and so on. So, so that's where it all kind of started um, back then. Um, and, and since then, it's been it's been developing quite rapidly. Um, I suspect, you know, in the last sort of five to seven years, with uh, COVID, with uh, the Paris Agreement being signed, there's been a lot more interest in, in this area. And increasingly, we're seeing that uh, investors, particularly, are, are pushing their their money. When I say investors, I mean big superannuation funds. Um, you know, Australia's got about three and a half trillion dollars of of superannuation funds invested. The world, um, the world money markets, if you like, are over a hundred trillion dollars, uh, and much of that is is earmarked uh, around principles of responsible investment. So the money has been sort of slowly, I guess, adopting a longer term view of societal good, both environmental and social. And the momentum is increasing, or do you feel like it's staying steady? Um, it, it certainly has increased, and and one of the one of the reasons for that was, you know, if, uh, there's been a bit of a pincer movement. So initially, the the investment community was looking for safer long-term investments, and safer meant that um, by safer they meant companies that were not going to lose their license to operate, whether from a regulatory perspective or uh, or from a community saying we don't want you here anymore. So that was the initial um, impetus that and. What happened in the last, uh, what has happened increasingly in the last decade is that customers have started saying, well, we actually want products that are more responsible. And many of those uh, demands have come from um, the, the renewable energy sector, the, mm -hmm. the electric vehicle sector, which is rapidly growing. Uh, and the customers in those areas are perhaps a little bit more focused on things like climate change and a, a broader societal good, not, not doing so much damage. So now we're seeing a pincer movement where the investment community was, was asking for more of this ESG focus, and now the markets are asking for more of this ESG focus. So given um, WA Landcare Network is ethics and values driven organisation, what are the prospects from your view in finding ESG funding and partnerships that avoid the risk of greenwashing? Well, that's a really good question. Um, greenwashing is very topical at the moment. Um, and it, it's, it stems from, it's human nature. So human nature, um, 
around boards in Australia and, and overseas, you, you'll hear this phrase, let's tell our story. And it's a reputation building, mm -hmm. you know, let's tell our story. Uh, and it's human nature to, to tell your story in the best possible light for yourself, right? Um, so that's not quite greenwashing, that's, that's simply, you know, uh, leaving out the bad bits and, and, and telling people the good bits. But you can see how without control of greenwashing, you, you do get people, uh, companies, telling outright fibs. Uh, or somewhere in the middle, you might have PR, PR uh, divisions of a company, mm -hmm. perhaps overstating or highly embellishing the, the, what they're doing in the ESG world. So this term greenwashing has become um, more prevalent and the, the practice of greenwashing is, is more obvious these days. We're, we're on the lookout for it. So, so that, that's, the, that's the setup that we have. But, but what's really happening now is um, if I indulge in greenwashing mm -hmm. and um, for the purpose of getting more of your investment dollar, um, and we talked about you know, the investment requirement around ESG, then what, what happens is um, if I overstep a mark, if I greenwash, if I, if I um, attract your investment by telling you little fibs, mm -hmm. Um, I am now stepping across a regulatory boundary. I'm now uh, at risk of being pursued by regulators. Um, and I'm, I'm at risk of um, significant reputational damage. Uh, I'm at risk of class actions, for example, as mm -hmm. it happened around the world. So greenwashing is a threat, but companies um, are trying increasingly not to do so much of it, you know, to really pull back, think about, are we, can we prove what we're saying? You still have bad actors, that's, that's still out there, so mm -hmm. not all companies are, are taking it as seriously as they might. So, so the chances are good. That, that I would say it's, it's a case of uh, being careful about what might be uh, embellished in partnerships. So, you, you know, and one way to do that, uh, in, the investment community has done this for a very long time, they will say, well, we will lend you the money or we will buy equity in your firm, but we want your ESG performance independently verified, as an example. So, so there are tools you can use. Understanding that greenwashing is out there, understanding the companies uh, that are preserving their reputation don't really want to uh, embark on, on greenwashing. So the door is open for a conversation that says, well, uh, how do we get third party validation? How do we get independent validation of what you're saying about your uh, rehabilitation or your water quality or mm. your your, your uh, decarbonisation pathway? What if WA Landcare is in partnership that has non-disclosure agreements? Will that gag us from talking about bad practices like greenwashing? So the, so the answer is it depends on the NDA, the non-disclosure agreement. Um, and remember, it's a, it's, a, it's an agreement. It's a it's a two way thing. Mm -hmm. um, so as as a partner with a corporate, I would I would firstly encourage you to have a good legal look at any NDA. Typically, a company might give you an NDA and say, "Please sign this." Uh, it's perfectly feasible to, for you to say, "Well, can we add something, or can we um, mm -hmm. can we make this a little bit clearer, or protect your own interests?" So. So NDAs aren't a one-way tool. They are, in fact, an agreement, and, and you can have input to that agreement. So that's that's one way one way to do it. Um, you know, but there is an element of good faith in all of this. So, for example, if you are in a um, if you're in a, a partnership with a with a corporation, and you disagree with the uh, the amount of topsoil that they're using on their rehabilitation of the mine. Um, that might not be a reason to go to the six o'clock news. You might actually have a conversation mm. through their grievance mechanisms. So as you enter into partnerships, you know, you can make the NDAs more flexible by discussing the agreement. You can also agree on if you're disagreeing with things, what is the appropriate process to go through? What is mm. the grievance mechanism? And remember, many companies will also have a, a whistleblowing policy. So. Um, yeah, again, that, that area is getting a little bit more sophisticated in terms of um, calling out bad behaviours. Okay, okay. So that sounds reasonable, but are companies actually accountable for ESG performance? So I'll, I'll talk about accountability um, like, a, like a ladder, like runs in a ladder. Mm -hmm. The lowest level of accountability is what the law says you must do. 
Okay. If you're unable to do what the law says you must do, then clearly you're behaving illegally. Right? So, so that's your bottom level of performance. Um, now, at, at high rungs of the ladder might be adopted standards. So a company might say, well, the law says we should do X, Y, and Z, but we're going to do a little bit more uh, for whatever reason. And a good example might be climate change. You know, there mm -hmm. are no specific laws about the rate of decarbonization you must have, but a company might say, you know, we might uh, decarbonize to 50% by 2035. So and that would be, that would be a self-adopted standard or self-adopted measure. Right? So accountability, uh, the lowest level, level of accountability is with, with your regulators. Mm -hmm. The next level of accountability is uh, there is a little bit of market force around that. So if I say I'm going to decarbonize this quickly by 2035, but I'm not quite reaching that, then as long as it's not hidden, as long as I, people can see, stakeholders can see that I'm maybe falling short of the mark, then we're, 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 not, um, we're not hiding bad performance. We're opening up a conversation about how to improve that performance. And so I think as you think about your partnerships, Remember that the bottom rung is always there. You should have a discussion with your partners about which rung of the ladder you would like to agree mm -hmm. that uh, that um, you're going to agree on, on what performance looks like, and then you hold each other accountable. Have you had um, experiences of, of ESG partnerships between governments, communities, or NGOs and corporates that have worked? I've been quite lucky to see some some good ones. Um, some, some ones that, because of the spirit of goodwill and, and the transparency between parties, mm -hmm. has, has resulted in, in progressive um, uh, outcomes over a period of time. So um, I, th there are ones that haven't worked for, for good reasons, mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I have seen them work and I'm a firm believer. Um, I, 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 I always, um, you know, one of my favorite sayings is that ESG is a team sport. I'm a firm believer that stakeholders working together um, in openness and transparency and with um, you know, the, the best endeavors are likely to build enduring partnerships. And how long, yeah, how long do you think they do last typically? Um, I'll, I'll turn that question on its head. Um, how short is too short? So ESG, by its very nature, whether it's environmental or social, tends not to be something that you see um, performance within two months or three months. Mm -hmm. If you think about biodiversity, you might need a couple of seasons of regrowth, for example, to see that your biodiversity is taking hold. So um, I, would, I would say be wary of short-term agreements that don't actually allow performance to be reached, whether it's water quality or mm -hmm. biodiversity or, or decarbonization or whatever. Um, I, I've seen uh, partnerships last up to a decade uh, I've seen partnerships that have been renegotiated at certain points. Um, so for example, KPIs, key performance indicators haven't been met. So it's back to the, back to the table to re, we have a rethink, how can we do this better? Mm. Is the partnership still working? Uh, and those are all done in, in, in the spirit of good faith. So overall, you sound cautiously upbeat about ESG partnerships. Uh, am I getting that right? I do believe that. To perform, uh, to have ESG performance, it, it does actually take stakeholders to come together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, companies need to be accountable for their legal requirements, obviously, but in terms of um, uh, performance in areas where stakeholders are involved, the more collaboration there is, the more likely you are to have better results over the longer term. Well, let's hope ESG attracts more and more partnerships. And thanks so much today, Raj, for your time and sharing your thoughts. You're welcome.